Horror Film Podcast. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, We're sorry. <laughs> in several years on whatever the sequel to the internet is, you'll be getting pop-up ads of, like... If you listen to the Spectator Film Podcast, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Oh my God. Should we start over? I don't want to say that I'm like, I, that That destroys my like plausible deniability. <laughs> I can't put myself in that situation. I'm sure you'll edit it out in post. It's fine. Okay, I'll just start here. Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. Yes, we are having a completely normal conversation that will not be held liable in the future. Yes. I wonder if I'll actually edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> what a great gag. I'm Austin. I'm Max. <laughs> and today we're doing Sherlock Jr. Um, which surprisingly is not a direct to DVD Disney yeah, sequel <laughs> thing that came it, out. It does sound like one. It kinda. sounds like, oh, this is the sequel to The Great Mouse Detective and or it's like Sherlock Jr. Young Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, there's yeah. no there's no stained glass night in this movie, unfortunately. Um, no, although I'm sure Buster Keaton could have found a way to do it <laughs> before Pixar. Yeah, there are some striking visual effects in this movie that yeah. like actually make you or just like, huh, that's really impressive. There's that's a lot of cool shit in this movie. Yeah. But uh, anyway, this was my pick this week, and uh, I thought it was a good contrast to do after our sort of Halloween stuff we've been up to. But also, I uh, have been wanting to do some silent comedy for a long time, and we've only done one silent film, really. Yes. And that was like a a very like serious, um, sincere melodrama. Uh, and this one sort of actually makes fun of that type of movie a little bit more. Um, but I just, I, I'm a huge fan of Buster Keaton. I've always loved Buster Keaton and I'm sure people on the internet, on film Twitter, some I've seen are like a little bit, I don't know. I don't want to say exhausted, but like a little bit tired of like the Keaton supremacy when it comes to silent comedy. But I really do think it's earned because I really just don't feel as much as I love Harold Lloyd or Charlie Chaplin or many of the other, um, silent comedians, uh, because mostly it's just those three who get mentioned, but Regardless, I think Buster Keaton is still the best. I think his his uh, gags are the best, and I think his movies are just the most inventive. And uh, I'm not really sure what my favorite movie of his is. It might be this, but it might also be The General. So I think it's probably between these two. But I just felt like this urge to do this movie, and uh, it's a blast, and it's only 50 minutes. You can watch it three times before you finish uh, Avengers 9 once. <laughs> So Avengers nine Ultron needs some new Ram. Uh, that's, that's going to be the next movie. Right. But yeah, Austin's been wanting to do a silent film for quite a while now. And I've always sort of been just like, yeah, man, we'll talk about it next week. Let's do focus on this now. Not because I don't like these movies or think there's a lot of relevant conversation to be have, but honestly, it's like an area of film study that I do I wouldn't consider myself like super well informed on. Or do you go out of your way to like watch no, silent comedy really? I like I've seen every instance of Charlie Chaplin's tramp character because that was a very focused area in a lot of the film classes I've wow. taken. So that's a lot. It's a lot. I've yeah. seen that. So I know a lot of Chaplin and of course I love the great dictator. But other than that, the silent comedy area is a bit of a blind spot for me, knowledge wise. So I'm always hesitant to do this era of films mainly because like I feel like I'm not going to have a lot to contribute, but this is a great film on a technical level and just based on special effects and acting, both areas I feel like I can <laughs> contribute to a bit, but I'm not going to be doing a whole lot of in-depth diving, but this is like it's my first time seeing this movie, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that makes this movie, I think, very... Um, I don't know if accessible is the right word, because I feel like that word is sometimes vague and, and doesn't make a lot of sense. In the accessible way people can use it. mean dumb a lot of the time, too. Um, yeah, but also, like, it is almost 100 years old. But also, when you say accessible, it seems to sort of put down movies from back then as if they're not accessible which they are more so than people give them credit for. Well, like, yeah, that's the point. Like, But I think my thing is just like, th it's more like magnetic. Like he does things that are insane with stunts. Uh, we have lots of fun trivia about that. Um, and his stunts are just always the most acrobatic, incredible things that also are always funny. Yeah, He's su suck always a dick funny. Evil Knievel. <laughs> Fucking yeah, Evil Knievel can't do shit. Evil Knievel just puts something dangerous in a pit of water 
that he's never going to come close to anyway. And then he rides a motorcycle over it. But now this like this, you're just like, fuck, there's no way they could have faked this back then. Yeah. It's Why insane. are you doing this? So there's lots of crazy shit in this. And uh, I think this opinion I'm about to offer might blindside you a little bit because I don't think I really got this across in our like preview discussion. But I think this may be the best movie we've done on the show so far. There's so much going on under the hood with this movie. Uh, it's so intelligent in its subtext. Uh, I know a lot of um, sort of Buster Keaton scholarship has gravitated towards this movie in the last few decades because it is so self-reflexive and about the way we watch movies, um, while at the same time still subordinating all of that toward a very like classical, um, well-controlled Hollywood story. And I think it just accomplishes both of those things so seamlessly, but in doing so provides so much amazing subtext. And it's so entertaining to watch that it's it's going to be a real challenge to like fit all of that in like 50 minutes while we're watching it. But it's just really like a solid movie. I don't know what to say to like convince people who might not be into silent comedy or Buster Keaton, Buster Keaton specifically to watch this because it's 50 minutes. Yeah, that's that's what I say. It's a, it's a grand old romp in 50 minutes. I wouldn't agree with you that it's the best film that we've done on here, but it is definitely worth your time and thought and just admiration really yeah so i just i really love this movie and uh yeah so before we jump in though i do want to set up part of our conversation because again 50 minutes and i have this amazing book here um austin's got a book edited by andrew horton it's a collection of essays it is the Cam cambridge film handbook on sherlock jr and uh, it's really great and has lots of great resources for study about Buster Keaton. But I just want to read two paragraphs, basically. And uh, I think this is a good entry point into discussing this movie and essentially what, what this essay written by Henry Jenkins is discussing is the two sort of things at play in this movie and throughout some of Keaton's other films around this time. And uh, what he does is he lo locates Sherlock Jr. at like a crossroads between the more vaudevillian, uh, hectic, crazy types of silent comedy that were coming before, and then the more narrative-dominated um, sort of classical realism type of comedy that follows this movie. And it sort of works as like a transition point in Buster Keaton's career for those things, because after this, he would go on to make more and more features, whereas before this, he really mostly made shorts. So this is kind of like a transition point for those as well. Anyway, I'm about to read it. So uh, it begins. Vaudeville style was streamlined, stripped down to those elements most likely to provoke emotion, building towards a wow climax, a moment of peak spectacle calculated to ensure a final burst of applause. Performers often di directly address the audience or crossed beyond the footlights making little attempt to preserve the invisible fourth wall that characterized theatrical realism. Vaudeville performers foregrounded the pr process of performance, often in highly reflexive ways, as when the Keatons structured their performance around Buster's perpetual disruption of his father's act and included orchestra members and stagehands as part of the performance. Closely related to this reflexive quality in the vaudeville performance was what Neil Harris calls the operational aesthetic, a fascination with how things work, with the mechanics and technology of showmanship. Vaudeville was not about telling stories. It was about putting on a show, and more than that, it was about each performer's individual attempt to stop the show and steal the applause. Vaudeville had little use for the trappings of theatrical realism. It was about the spectacular, the fantastic, and the novel. Vaudeville had little use for continuity, consistency, or unity. It was about fragmentation, transformation, and hetero heterogeneity. The incorporation of this vaudeville tradition was what gave silent screen comedy its intensity and fascination. It was also what made the genre's absorption into into the mainstream of classical Hollywood cinema so problematic. Classical cinema, like theatrical realism, was in the business of telling stories, constructing characters, maintaining continuity, consistent, consistency, unity, causality, and plausibility. Classical cinema, unlike vaudeville, sought to efface the mechanisms of its production, presenting itself as a coherent, self-contained world, cut off from the realm of spectator experience. So that was a whole waterfall of words for everybody, but I'm going to include that in show notes. But the point is, those are the two things that I think are a good entry point in this movie, the two things that are confronting one another in the film. You have the vaudeville slapstick antics conflicting 
with the sort of narrative drive to tell this story, to have realism, uh, plausibility. These two things are at play uh, majestically in this movie, and, and Buster Keaton is able to use the contrast of those two things to set up a ton of really amazing gags. And uh, again, is this is a movie about somebody literally entering, entering a movie. So it is very much about sort of disrupting your, your idea of that fourth wall in a sort of way. Oh, yeah, 100%. Oh. So, yeah, I think that's a pretty good point to sort of jump in. Do you have anything else to say? Not in the least. All right. Because well, this is a silent film. We shouldn't be talking. Oh, my God. That's going to make this a challenge. It's going to be a weird commentary track. <laughs> Let's go, everyone. <laughs> You know, I was about to say that um, it's good that we're doing a silent film because we normally watch, for the commentaries at least, uh, muted. But that kind of does undercut how important music is to a lot of tonal scenes. Yeah, and the music films. is super important. And that's a good opportunity to mention that as far as the musical accompaniment for the one we're watching, we're watching a YouTube version, everybody. And we're going to post that in the show notes so you can find the same version we watched. Yeah, we probably should have mentioned that earlier on because most of the time you're just like, oh, I have to go find the movie they're right. watching now. But, this but is, we're also stupid. Yeah. This is so, the, this is in the public domain. So Yeah. So fortunately for us, you can just access this movie on YouTube, as is the case with a lot of Buster Keaton's silent yeah. movies. Um, but yeah, so we, we're about to start the movie and I am so excited. And I'm, I just had to let go that we're not going to be able to capture the brilliance of this movie truly in this episode. But we're going to try our best. But it starts not with jokes, not with jaunty music, not with silly things, but with an old proverb, which does lead into sort of jokes as we describe what our main character is. <laughs> but like, maybe it's just because I'm viewing this because like, like I said, most of my uh, experience with silent comedies is through a Chaplin lens. Right. But like Keaton's character does feel a lot like the tramp. Like he does... He has a similar mannerisms. I don't know a lot of that is just vaudevillian. Yeah, I mean, the vaudevillian stuff, too, is like something we're going to bring up later. The idea of being a boundary crossing fool type archetype. They're all sort of like that. Harold Lloyd's as well. Um, In different ways, they sort of exist as marginal characters and then try to find a way to success, even though, you know, the odds are stacked against them because they're not normal in a specific way. I like the how the how to be a detective book doesn't even have an author or anything. No, <laughs> it's, it's it just, just exists. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's interesting because that's a the fact of this being a Sherlock movie or a parody of Sherlock, which was super popular, obviously at this time, um, is interesting as a transition from our Hammer movies in our Hammer series that we did during Halloween. Which, for anybody who doesn't know, they rely a lot on that sort of Sherlock esque paternal authority figure yeah male masculine paragon who is rationalist and can demystify monsters and deal with them and get rid of that chaos and i think that similar idea is going to come up here ah yes the fake movie hearts and pearls which we'll be talking about more later wonderful name uh just because it's so perfectly is like evocative of those types of like the lounge lizards lost D. W. love griffith melodramas yeah but yeah so um, <clears throat> the first thing to mention here in terms of how the vaudeville stuff incorporates with the story is we begin with essentially story and character elements and then we go into, va- into the vaudeville stuff and a lot of people will talk about the way in which all of this is sort of in service of narrative and it's interesting because even though those two things are sort of at conflict with one another all throughout this movie I think this movie has like an insanely classic Hollywood narrative. We talked about it in the pre-screening, but it reminded us a lot of like Wizard of Oz. Oh yeah, very, very much so. That right? The note with one key difference, which we'll get to later. Yeah. It, well, are you referring to the ending? Not the ending, but like the. <laughs> there is just a bunch of physical comedy. I love this. He's just created it. I'm I'm more talking about the dissolution of tension. But uh, rather okay, than yeah, yeah. Itself, but that that's a little bit different as well. But in terms of the structure, it's very much the idea that okay, we have our character in the. It's actually very similar to the Eraserhead structure as well, and we talk about um, how that works on sort of Lacanian terms in that episode too. Yeah. But 
it's very similar because you end up with this character who at the beginning in the first act is in a world of lack and desire where things are imperfect because they want something or they have goals that they haven't achieved yet. And then what happens after they struggle to achieve their goals in this first section of the movie is that they move on to a magical world. Right. And that, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's going to happen a lot by the way we're just going to be making points and then interrupt ourselves because the gags are so great describe the dollar <laughs> so what we're watching right now is we're watching this helpless young boy he's, get duped into giving this pretty lady a dollar and he's like before he gives it to her he's like just can you describe it yeah um because yeah. buster wants to buy some candy or something for his sweetheart want to get some chocolates for his girlfriend this is hilarious too. This old lady who's looking and she's crying. And then the title is just like, I lost a dollar. (laughs) It's like, what you're crying. This is back in the olden days when a dollar could buy you a life. You, you had a night on a town with $1 where dollar made you like emperor Xerxes. Yes. You would, you just had more money than you knew what to do with. You could uh, feed your entire family for months with a dollar. Buy a whole store for a nickel. Oh, I thought you meant eat the dollar. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was probably more nutritional than a lot of the stuff <laughs> they were handing out in the 20s. But Well, not cocaine, as we discussed in our Dracula episode. Oh, yeah. Or no, I'm sorry, Coca-Cola. <laughs> There's a little Freudian slip right there. <laughs> same thing. It really was the same thing. It, it was. That's a great scary man. They just intimidated him into giving the dollar. But what was I talking about? So, yeah, comparing this to Wizard of Oz, right? So... The second act involves them going to a uh, sort of fantasy land, right? Yeah. And the trauma and problems of the first act and their real lives are sort of sublimated and repeated in the fantasy lands. We see the the same characters repeated in a slightly different way. And there are sort of adventures that they go on in that fantastical, magical area is part of what allows them to be equipped to address their problems once they return to the real, real world after the fact. So very classical Hollywood structure. I think, I don't know how you feel about this, but if somebody asked me what the most classical story was in terms of Hollywood storytelling, I'd probably say Wizard of Oz. Huh, I would, I don't know. I think the Wizard of Oz is a bit, maybe because I'm just, I usually think of like, I know Wizard of Oz pretty clearly follows the three X structure. Um, I mean, most movies do, but I always think like the it it is a hero's journey story, but it's a bit of a subversion on that. And I always think that like hero's journey is the most stereotypical Hollywood type story. I think that's more of a new Hollywood innovation, though, because that only starts happening like deliberately and self-consciously after Lucas and Star Wars. Yeah. And Sid Field, you know, he's the guy who came up with like the whole like three act Hollywood thing is like you got to do this by this page etc 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 oh if we're going like classic like classic like old school i thought you just meant yeah. hollywood in general okay yeah. i mean i i view it as the basis upon which all hollywood stories okay yeah even if it's not that way chronologically i think yes. that's like fundamentally that captures the zenith of what that is oh here we have the awkward uh romance the accidental proposal <laughs> I guess, did he just propose to her or did he just give her a ring because he doesn't know what to do? I think it like he was trying to put it on the middle finger and then it didn't fit. <laughs> yeah, he put it on the wrong finger. No, he put it on the middle finger and it didn't fit. So he put it on the that finger and then like that's an accidental proposal. Thing. Well, it's interesting because we talked about this too, how his awkwardness in this sort of like mating ritual and his own desire for Catherine McGuire, the girl, mm-hmm. is something that comes up in the subtext as well. Um Oh, here we have the sheik who we didn't mention yet. He's he's an evil man. He, yes. He'll steal from the girl's father to get the bigger chocolate thing so that he can win her heart with chocolates. Is it chocolate? What the fuck is it? it just yeah. looks like a box. You see there, there's try our okay. fancy chocolates in the background. It's right next to the movie theater. It's like a, it was called like a confectionery or yeah. something like that. So you buy the cheaper food. Yeah. To go in and watch the movie. Or I think that was before, like, movie theaters had their own... <laughs> I love this moment. <laughs> Hold my hand. They and The moment they both, like, physically, like, get shocked when they touch each other is, like, amazing. Well, I think that's her showing agency. That's her just being like, fucking come on, man. 
<laughs> oh yeah, I mean she she consistently yeah takes action, especially in regards to the actual romantic stuff more than he does. And we get close-ups of her that actually show like her emotional response to different moments. Whereas with him, he mostly we get the impression is interested in this romance because it's some sort of kind of like prescriptionist gender role thing that he feels like he must do. Yeah. But also there's a weird contradiction because he kind of feels at odds with it. Mm-hmm. And here we see another version of the sort of vaudevillian disruption. I don't know why he got a banana there. But well, I think that was his excuse for going into the room. He's like, oh, I just want one of the fruits. But it's sort of like you have a stage, right? That's set yeah. by the curtains and he breaks through it to try to disrupt the romance almost in an attempt at a vaudevillian thing to again i think the other thing about this is you can really very easily uh sort of combine the idea of the romantic consummation as something that represents or equals narrative consummation yeah so when romance is interrupted when his romance with Catherine mcguire is interrupted or delayed that's because of the intrusion and in sort of anti-narrative stuff caused by slapstick well, her plan. And it's interesting because all his attempts at slapstick, and as we'll see shortly, all his attempts at being a uh, detective are totally subverted in this first part of the movie and backfire on him 100%. <laughs> He's so useless. He's worse than useless. If he did nothing, he'd be in a better position. Very true. <laughs> yeah. If he didn't pull out his book and just be like, what do I do now? He's but, obviously ex- not absorbed any of that book. But, no. Except to look at things with a magnifying glass. Search everybody. Again, we see the Sheik uses everything against him. I remember yesterday, um, because I didn't, just the way his suit is cutting it off and the way the film looks, it looks like the Sheik, in some shots, has his pants up to his chest (laughs) just because his vest is the same color. It would be funny. But, I mean, he's sort of treated like a lounge lizard, so that would be bizarre. Yeah. He... Is is this might not be clear to us everybody now, but he's sort of um a not a direct parody, but he's a parody of a type of guy that is sort of related to like oh, that's a really great Jake. Hey, don't search me. I'm the guy who lost the watch. Yeah. By the way, that was played by Joe Keaton, his father, who trained him in vaudeville because Buster Keaton, his entire family was in vaudeville um his entire life. Uh and also, you know, Buster Keaton is kind of like the chosen one of that sort of thing because of how many like famous, amazing performers he interacted with. He, uh, Harry Houdini was his godfather. And also he like, he hung out with like Bojangles Robinson and people like that. So he knows a lot about all this stuff and that's what he's been doing his entire life. Will Smith. God damn it. Will Will Smith. Smith. You gave him the money. Welcome to earth. Did you really need that? Gold watch, Will Smith, you're not making enough money off the royalties from Aladdin and Bright. Well, maybe not Bright, but come on, Aladdin royalties got to be paying you well enough. Really? Really? That movie was a flop. Was it? Yeah. Oh, my God. It didn't make that much. Well, it wasn't a flop. Exactly. But <laughs> you got me excited there. For it didn't second. make a ton of money. Or maybe people just reacted to it and were like, this is terrible. I think it was critically maligned but i think it still made a bajillion million oh, dollars damn it. like all of the disney remakes are going to be because everybody you can have your cake and fuck it too oh, that way pff, of just like yeah this movie's bad and it's worse than the original and here's why but you still paying to see the movie uh let's go back to a happier time in cinematic history like right now you mean the cinema of attractions yeah i i'm surprised i didn't use that phrase yet because that's right in line with like the vaudeville versus narrative narrative drive conversation Mm -hmm. we're having the classical hollywood narrative um yeah that's just worth mentioning too this movie combines a lot of stuff that we've talked about in terms of theory on a bunch of other episodes you can definitely do the type of like narcissistic identification oh she gave him his ring Mm -hmm. you know sad is it, though? Because it's pretty clear by the end of the movie that that's not really what he wants either. <laughs> Listen, it was the 20s. <laughs> not, neither of them really want it, honestly. Mm. I don't know. I think we get the impression that she actually wants that. And he it's like doesn't them, understand. It's like they're... It's like they're actually like actors, almost. They're just like... 
and they don't have the scripts, but they have a general idea of where the, yeah. the flow is supposed to I go. I mean, that's we're, we're hinting at it, but we're going to talk about how interesting this movie gets with gender stuff, which yeah. is why I brought up the hammer thing. And, you know, Sherlock is a, as a uh, sort of paragon of masculinity and rationality earlier. But there's a lot of interesting stuff with gender in this. And because this movie is so self-reflexive, it's like also holding up gender roles and gendered behaviors as like something that is part of a performance that you watch in a movie and enact. By the way, we were just watching him shadow his man closely, so Talk to speak. about physical acting. Also, yeah. Buster Keaton almost got crushed by a train car there. and did, <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Yes, he frequently did things that seemingly would kill most people. Yes, he's a chaotic trickster god. Uh, yeah, but even when he's walking just behind him, in sync with him, think about how much control that takes. No, all this physical acting, like not just Buster Keaton, but that takes like... Yeah, good effort on the part of the actor playing the Sheik as well. Like, you guys have to be perfectly in sync for everything. If he makes a wrong movement, then Buster Keaton's going to run into him no matter how good of a physical actor he is. Now, Max, this is the famous trivia moment. Okay. And I'm going to interrupt you just to read a little paragraph. I remember you mentioned directly in this scene yesterday when we were watching this, like, I'm amazed he didn't die. So yeah. I'm just going to read this quote from a documentary from his wife. The train went out from under him. He wrote... <laughs> He rode the water tower down to the track, but he didn't realize how much force that water had, and it threw him against the railroad track with the back of his head. He had a terrible headache. I think they called off shooting for a few days anyway. Then he went back to work, and that was the end of that until about 12 or 13 years later. He went in for a complete physical, x-rays, and the whole lot. And the doctor said, when did you break your neck? He said, I never broke my neck. He said, yes, you did break your neck. Buster said, do you think it could have been when I hit my head against a railroad track? The doctor said... Sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And that is the take in the movie. <laughs> I mean, he did it perfectly, so why wouldn't you use that? Right. Jesus Christ. But it's amazing that you can't see it because it's underwater, but yeah. it, it was just hilarious to me that you said that yesterday, and I didn't tell you because I wanted to get the reaction. Jesus fucking Christ, though. During the episode, but he broke his fucking neck. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then he just got up and ran away in the same shot. Fucking A. <laughs> you know what he's like? Do you remember that uh, Greg Jennings video? No. The one where he's like, Greg Jennings broke his fucking leg. The Madden video game? No. What is wrong with you? I don't. I thought you're the one who talks about how hip you are. I mean, that video is you know, 12 yeah. years old or whatever. <laughs> Cutting edge with the kids. <laughs> Everyone knows that Greg Jennings put the team on his back video, Max. You're going to have to watch it in the show notes. Okay. You're missing out. It's great. It's probably sports related, so I don't know anything about it. But yeah, so but now we, we were going to transition here, he, but he broke his fucking neck. Yeah. and But I mean, narrative wise, he's just given up, which that's the thing. Like the tension has already been resolved at this point. Yeah, because we know we just saw we talked over it talking yeah. about the like spectacle of Buster breaking his neck and then just walking it off. Um, but you get that moment that's really kind of neat where Catherine McGuire goes to the pawn shop and then we can see basically just because the guy coincidentally walks by yeah. and gets ID'd as the, as the person who pawned the watch that she's now learned the truth and that the sheik is going to be fingered for the crime. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yeah. That'd be a very different kind of movie. Um, but what? Nothing. Um, hey, now. You're an all-star. <laughs> but <laughs> talking about cutting-edge memes... But no, we got the wonderful uh, transparency um, <laughs> thing for the dream sequence. Oh, the double, the yeah, double exposed negative. Yes. Yeah, um, this is this is interesting too because, like, like is mentioned in that first essay in the book. There's Buster is like really good at doing two types of tricks in this movie. You have uh, the performance virtuosity, which is just him doing something amazing in front of the camera. But then he's also really great at doing the camera tricks, the camera magic, and he combines them yeah. in different ways. And uh, I think this is super interesting because like you said, uh, oh, this is great too. He grabs the dream hat. Yes. <laughs> the hat is dreaming as well. Yeah. But it's really great the way he does this because like you said, since the narrative tension is now dissipated, this entire sequence of the hearts and pearls sequence where he goes into the movie, essentially the rest of the movie until he gets out of the movie at the end is a vaudeville diversion. Yeah. Because it, it 
technically, if you think about it, what's happening in the story right now? Nothing. He's just sleeping. Yeah. And then he gets woken up by his girlfriend and she's like, don't worry, everything's fine. Yeah. So even when there's a story going on in this movie, it is not actually a story it's part of this it's a protracted vaudeville sequence which is exemplified by again the way he's he's crossing the boundary into the film then getting thrown out and then trying to do it again and then he'll successfully do it uh famously this i mean this is probably the most famous sequence of this movie yeah um and then the movie turns into instead of a melodrama it turns into like the most bizarre surreal scenery documentary i don't even know what the fuck you'd call it like what what is the genre of the movie net like it's interesting to think about the movie just being this way if he wasn't in it like what is this movie about well yeah because i i made a joke because i was watching this for the first time yesterday that i thought it was like gonna cut back to hit like his asleep body just like hitting all the levers on the projector so it's just like rapidly switching between movies (laughs) and you're like no wait a second it's just yeah and you're like, what is this movie? Well, there's a lot of old stuff in films that, like, you can tell, like, they're doing this because it would be fun to do. Yeah. But, and I mean, this I is... I respect that. This is super vaudevillian. Yeah. Because this has nothing to do with story at all. <laughs> it's just, like, this is fun to do. And, I mean, think about how much performance virtuosity he's showing here. The ability to be so coordinated that, like, to, first of all, film this the way they did it. Um, where they sort of cut out, they shot the outside, the oh, right exterior here. framing thing. We have some early test footage of Roar, complete, yes. complete with the actor being genuinely uncomfortable around the lions in the frame. Yeah, I don't know if he actually got in a cage with lions. I wouldn't. He, dude fucking broke his neck jumping off a train. But he wasn't trying to break his neck. I know. <laughs> Whereas if you're in a cage with lions, I think you're asking for it. <laughs> no, man, lions are our friends. You just got to hug them. Yeah, uh, okay. Tippy Andrin. Uh... <laughs> But yeah, so the way they did this is they shot the framing part first and then they cut it out and then held that up basically as like a frame that they put in front of the lens when they shot all this stuff after. And basically they just, all of this was done in camera. But the point is it's it's really amazing because of how much coordination they put into it and how how good they are at like just matching these shots. Yeah. You know? It is it is absolutely ridiculous. Um, Especially the parts where he gets thrown out. It looks absolutely yeah, seamless. I still don't entirely believe. That, you, know, <laughs> you can provide me all the historical documents. I still think that they just put a black frame around a stage thing for that. Like all of these, I can 100% believe they did in-camera stuff for. But like, yeah, I'm not so sure about that first scene. But it's just, it's really amazing. And then they synchronize the zooms on this. Yeah. To make it perfect. Too. It's just like, it essentially is, winds up being simple things, but they put so much effort into just making it look good, you know? Yeah, but here now we've been completely absorbed into Oz. We're completely in the yes, <laughs> realm of fantasy. The land of Oz, which now is like a lavish 20s yeah. thing. We got it. She's our, our girl character has become a flapper, right? <laughs> and now everything has been sublimated. So, oh, who stole the pearls? Oh, God. But yeah, none of this has this, the fact that this is very, <laughs> like none of this shenanigans has anything to do with the plot anymore. Yeah. This the is plot is resolved. Yeah. Whereas as far as we know with Dorothy and Oz, it's yeah. actually going on. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, oh God, Sherlock Jr. The struggle in Oz is supposed to mirror her inter- internal struggle and show her character growth. Whereas this, it's just. It's just wish fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why, you know, psychoanalysts go crazy. About this movie because it has that whole dreaming equals getting absorbed and identifying with movies thing. I love how the butler it just has those explosive 13 balls ready to fucking go. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then he just throws a giant bomb in the backyard and no one hears it. Yeah. Well, no, it's a silent film. They can't hear it. Ah, there you go. <laughs> now you're thinking. I think that was a Calvin and a Hobbes joke at one point where the, his dad's fucking with him and he's just like, oh yeah, sound and color weren't invented until the 40s. Yeah. <laughs> Everything before then was quiet and dark. Um, no wonder old people hate Twitter so much. <laughs> well, I guess that would still go on in silent movies. Yeah. But, but no, yeah. they just they just hate the... the they boot. hate everybody talking. Yeah. <laughs> Those damn kids and their TikTok. That's why they're so bad at hearing things. They're not used to it still. Yeah. Sound is a new invention. Crime crushing criminologist. (laughs) That's what you do at work, right? No, I'm a 
Lally, yeah, well, what was the thing that lousy lizards love life? <laughs> love, <laughs> a lounge lizard? Yeah, lounge you know lizards what, love life. You know what the implication of that is? Like, they That is their job. Do you know what it is? <laughs> no. They're gigolos. Oh. Waiting on uh, wealthy women. So I didn't think you actually wanted to reveal that, but... Well, there goes my dating strategy. Oh. <sighs> Must be weird to make your face go so close to your dad's face and look at him that way. I, I think it would just be fun. <laughs> 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 but yes, yeah, so that the other part of this, and again, connecting it to the Hammer movies, it's it's a very natural transition, which was not intended, but we have what's going on here in this classical story. He's taking on this Sherlock role, right? The masculine paragon of rationality who's going to demystify and figure everything out because he can perceive everything. Um, but also the Oedipal exchange as something that drives narrative where you have the young man. Oh God. I think every movie that has a, a poison vial that is marked by a skull and crossbones is amazing. <laughs> I, I would have to agree with you. Uh, there's That's something definitely why Susan Kane is not my favorite movie. Yeah. Like, I think, I don't know. This might be a little tangenty, but I, I miss just like evil for evil's sake a lot of times. In yeah, cinema. we talked about this too. Like yeah. evil for evil's sake can be so great. It's Especially just, when they're having fun. Yes, if they're having fun and it's played straight. That's why but, I love Ursula. Yeah. Well, Ursula is divine as a mermaid. Yeah. Just as an evil sea witch and it's wonderful. God, when I first figured that out, that made my head explode <laughs> so much. Like, I cannot fucking believe it. I do. I wonder if that was like a Robin. You probably know more about this than I do. Like, was that a Robin Williams thing of just like, we made this character for the celebrity and if it doesn't work, it's going to be weird. But what uh, do you mean Robin Williams? Well, because like uh, the character of Genie was written specifically for Robin Williams before they had Robin Williams confirmed to be in the movie. Right. So like, I wonder if that was a like. As far as Little Mermaid is concerned? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, because um, it's not like they got a big celebrity to voice Ursula. No. So, I don't know. I'm just wondering. Maybe they just took Divine's likeness. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. This I mean, is the. I, I think Divine might have been a little too scandalous to associate with the Disney brand, though. So they were probably just like, no, you're using somebody else instead. Because that, that was the time when they were just like, no, we need to make Disney prestige. Oh, I love the way he winds up, too. Yeah. To, like, hit the ball, and then they run out of the room. And then we get a lot of uh, pool scenes. <laughs> Which, by the way, again, amazing physical physical acting. Yeah. Because you know what? None of this is a stunt. Buster Keaton did not know. By the way, is this pool or billiards? What the fuck is the difference? I think it's the same thing, honestly. Okay. Uh, relax, people. Just yeah. let's make life easier for ourselves. Yeah. Pool or billiards. Choose one. Uh, but he got good at both of them. Or we can just like repurpose stickball. Because you just say baseball now, so stickball can just be pool. I'm okay. fine with that. Yeah. But what he did was he covered the, the balls in powder so he could track how they like move across the table, and then he just spent time getting really good at it so he could just actually hit the pool balls this way. For anybody who's not watching this movie, what's happened is the evil butler and the sheik in Hearts and Pearls have all these weird murder gags they're trying to get to try to get Buster to kill himself or something. So he they... He doesn't figure out that they stole pearls. Yeah. From even Buster. though they would incriminate themselves as murderers, but whatever. It's fine. Yeah. But what they did was they had an explosive number 13 pool ball <laughs> and they tr changed it with the normal one. And Buster Keaton turns out to be so good at pool that he gets every other ball in the hole before the 13 one. And then, and then he fucks up at the last minute and his turn is over. <laughs> <laughs> so the 13 one is the only one left. <laughs> yeah, but oh my God, you can just see him just like, wow, look how fucking great I am at pool now. <laughs> yeah. Just casually. That's definitely why it's the wish fulfillment thing. Because it's like, it's not just that he's a good detective. You know, it's not just that he's his ego ideal. It's that he's good at everything. He's a Mary Sue. <laughs> fucking... I was Buster Keaton so good at these things. I haven't seen him practice at all in this film. <laughs> oh, my God. I just love how, how like, horrified the Sheik is and runs out of the room right away. Oh, no. Like, like and this is the best where he just knocks it in the hole. And <laughs> then he just walks out and they're like, what the fuck happened? Yeah. Oh, that's the perfect payoff to that. We get so much buildup and then he just does it. 
and then nothing happens. It's hilarious. It's the wrong one. I, I'd love if it just exploded there. Mm-hmm. Or like Looney Tunes exploded. It's just like a dud. And this is interesting too, because we see Buster Keaton in the first half. He's the one that's setting up the vaudeville things. He throws the banana peel to try to get the sheik to fall, right? But then he falls. Now, this time, it's the bad guys who are setting up the, you know, the gags to try to get Buster Keaton to like kill himself or whatever. But they're the ones who fail, right? So the bomb thing doesn't work because Buster Keaton is like the best at pool ever. And then the Sheik almost cuts his leg off by stepping on the trap with the axe. And then the the uh, butler almost poisons himself. So it's the exact reversed. What a great title. By the next day, the mastermind had completely solved the mystery, with the exception of locating the pearls and finding the thief. You know, the mystery. <laughs> I say that all the time about myself. I have completely... In almost every way. Well, no, that's what we say about our podcast. We have uh, completely dominated the podcast market yeah. in all aspects of the fact that we don't have the most listeners and we don't have the best commentary. Yeah. Other than that, we're completely destroying the film We have a monopoly. Mar- yeah. Yeah. We get nailed for the antitrust laws. <laughs> I mean, who am I kidding? That's not happening nowadays. Yeah, no. We just... I still can't believe that Disney was able to successfully acquire all those properties from Fox. How did they let that happen? I have no idea, but... Well, anyway. (laughs) Here's a great stagecraft thing. It was just like going through doorways and everything. I did see a story today that uh, Amazon... No, it was that Disney wanted to acquire Twitter. Oh, there you go. And uh, it was stopped by Bob Iger because he's just like... It's so filled with hate. <laughs> I just open it up and it makes me sick. I'm just like, okay, good. If if that's the thing that stops you from controlling information. Well, sure. you know what? I, I hope they do buy Twitter because then the people who use Twitter who are annoying and then essentially spread Disney marketing. Yeah. And I know it's... At a comp- least they'll get paid, maybe. No. They'll just take out their frustration on, on Bob Iger instead of Jack Dorsey. Yeah. So they'll be forced to be confronted with Disney's evil instead of, you know, just allowing themselves to be like manipulated. Like there's smart people and film reviewers who are like, you know, when they write about Disney movies, they just don't acknowledge that they're basically doing marketing. Where it's like, you have to do that every time. At yeah. least I think, Oh God, here's an, another amazing stunt trapped on a roof. Don't worry. God, he's the just m- perfect at everything. The amount of stuff that could have gone fucking wrong. Just casually oh. break your legs immediately. Yeah. <sighs> oh, and there's Gillette hiding in the back, yeah. which is also really fun. He's 100% not there in that shot, but it's fine. No, he is. <laughs> you can see him <laughs> no, riding yeah. on the back. No, I'm saying in the previous one. But uh-huh. um, So the other interesting thing to notice throughout this movie is you get constantly motifs of people doing dress up, beginning with the first shot. What does Buster have in the first shot? Mustache. This entire movie is basically his attempt to get a real mustache, right? What will make me a man? Oh, yeah. I love this. Oh, yeah. I, I brought my uh, preloaded disguise kit. Yeah, of course, we have no idea what it is when they do it. So it's like, what the fuck is that? See a dress and a wig and a hat Yeah, inside a circus <laughs> thing. And again, the vaudeville part of it is that all of that is just for our benefit. Yeah. So we understand what it is. So it's not totally random, but they know what it is. So what's the point of looking at it? Doesn't matter. Just checking to see if everything's there. Oh, I love this too. He's just waiting to get like taken by these guys. <laughs> well, take me any time of day now. But again, if you want to talk about the way this, this movie is examining gender, you can also look at all these motifs of like manhood, right? What's on the wall right now? A bunch of boxers and everything. Men. It's a different type of manhood from Buster Keaton. Uh, Buster Keaton is that type of detective. But also the interesting part about this too, if we're going to go back to the sort of sexual dynamics, is that Buster Keaton as the detective, as is pointed out in another essay that I'll be quoting extensively in the show notes from the same book, Buster Keaton as the detective is similar to Buster Keaton as somebody who embodies the archetype of the fool, whereas both are sort of boundary crossing in terms of gender, right, and a little bit feminine. Whereas, you know, with the Sherlock Holmes, the Holmesian detective is kind of an inherently sort of uh, exclusionary character in terms of the way they treat women, right? Yeah. Holmes goes around with his male companion, Watson, right? But women are the inscrutable mystery that he cannot solve. 
And uh, I so think, nice to see that villains monologuing and ruining their evil plan goes all the way back, <laughs> even when they couldn't actually speak. When they couldn't even monologue, they're still monologuing. I do like. I there are so many times I could just be like, oh what is anybody's motivation? But like this entire film world is such like a farce that like, yeah, your suspension of disbelief. Just, it's just vaudeville. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this, the fact that we can see through the wall right now, just for our benefit and how, how amazing is yeah. that? The fact that he, it's only there so we can see that he does it in one take. Yeah. And that it's real. Jesus Christ though. Like, ugh. and again, another instance of dress up. Yeah. As far as gender is concerned, but he's not quite good enough. But I do love the way he just sort of gives up (laughs) and then runs away. But again, if we're going to talk about him being like a Mary Sue as well, (laughs) think about what's about to happen next with the other really crazy stunt that's about that. It's literally magical. There's no explanation for it at all. He's literally capable of magic. This is farcical, but like, uh, and then look how this is done. So for years, people were like, what the fuck? <laughs> Cause like that makes no sense. And all people were able to figure out was that like, okay, they were standing next to the fence. So it must be something with the fence. Right. And he goes through the fence in the movie, but in real life, like yeah. how they do it in real life, they did it with like a series of very like, it's not like overly complicated, but it's just perfectly masked. It's just like trap well, doors that work perfectly. Yeah. And you can see a little bit of an outline. Yeah. And also before, like you can kind of see the guy's head is like a little bit attached to the fence. In a yeah. Weird way. Yeah. But that's really all you can see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I still think it's really amazing. That trick. Here's another fun thing to mention. Uh, <laughs> I love the way he rips off his mustache, but I just think Buster Keaton is really great as an action director. That's something that's been more appreciated in recent decades about his movies is that he's actually a very fantastic director of action. And one of the most important American directors in terms of, you know, shooting action. But I think he's also very great at this very specific detail of action running. By the way, but fun fact, Buster Keaton was the guy who fell down right there. He did the stunt for other people too. So not only did he break his neck, he didn't do his, he didn't just do his own stunts. He, he did everyone's. <laughs> He's like Tom Cruise on steroids. And by the way, again, this is not fake. Buster Keaton, in order to do this, this chase sequence, which is definitely one of the most famous chase sequences, probably in the first half of the 20th century, he just learned how to ride a motorcycle on the handles. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I was not able to confirm it again, but it really just looks like for a lot of it, he's just doing it. Some like, of it is gorilla stuff. Some of the, I wasn't able to confirm that for sure, yeah, but like, but it looks like that, especially cause the grain pops way up. And yeah. it's like, they have no time to shoot this. Cause he was just a fucking public going through an intersection on a motorcycle. <laughs> Isn't that nuts? Like, I mean, yeah, some of it is obviously too like synchronized and, just perfect. Timing. Oh yeah. I mean the yeah. stuff with the person crossing the street and then yeah. things like this. But when he like the craziest part is just seeing him go through an intersection. Cause you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't care how planned that is. Like you could still die very easily. Yes. Doing that. Yeah. This is the weirdest one. Cause it's like, what is the explanation of these two trucks doing this? What are they doing? <laughs> you know, just being trucks. Hanging out. They're trying to give each other a high five yeah. right as they go by. Okay, got it. we'll go through this. But thing. that one's really scary too because that one has no... That one is not at all related to how well he does it. Yeah. You know, they the trucks have to time it perfectly, otherwise he's fucked. And that's nuts. <laughs> Nothing can stop him. He's invincible. I never thought you'd make it. That what a title card. <laughs> and then he realizes uh that there's nobody behind him. Oh, this was the one part that they uh, obviously did not do. This is I think pretty clearly like a rudimentary form of like stop motion animation it looks like yeah. where they just move it 
one frame at a time. Because again, Buster Keaton would take those risks, but that because he's he's one of the most acrobatic and like athletic, you know, vaudeville type performers. He he knows how to take a fall without what like it looks like he's in danger, but actually most of the time when he does it, he's not actually at risk of breaking his neck. I said yesterday I was half expecting this guy to also be his assistant. <laughs> It's like, no, don't worry, it's me. <laughs> but I do like that he just fucking kills this guy, though, by yeah. kicking him through the door. He flies through the wall, and then he just falls down and dies. It's yeah. kind of amazing. But yeah, so again, another thing to mention throughout all of this is we've seen now a lot of di- dynamic camera movement, and we've seen the thin movie open up. Buster goes from being sort of isolated and um, frozen in terms of his motion and his ability to move around through space to being like very much the master of space throughout this giant chase sequence, which is super dynamic. Um, but also it has to do with him sort of getting closer and closer to his embracing his, you know, masculine identity, his ego ideal, which again, like we said earlier is wrapped, wrapped up in consummating his romance. Right. And bringing back the 13. Yeah, no, I loved this. This was like, if you want like, an example of the idea of Chekhov's gun. That's not like an immediate setup and payoff. I think that like, if you want to show stuff in film school, it's yeah. like we established this much earlier on and it, it's not a huge plot element, but it's a fun little thing that we bring back. It's later. almost like a parody of it because yeah. the interesting thing about it too, is that it comes back, but the things that happen in the middle make absolutely no sense at all. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, we still bring back the thing cause that's what you do at a narrative story. That's yeah. again, going back to the conflict between those two things. And again, I, I I feel like Buster Keaton being one of the best action directors, you're going to see a lot of references to th- his things. Getting into Buster Keaton totally changed the way I watch Pirates of the Caribbean. So that's a fun thing to do for anybody who is into, you know, both of those movies. Um, I think what's about to happen is definitely, I mean, they stole a lot for, yeah. for like Jack Sparrow's character. Not only in, in the first movie, but in the first two sequels at least as well. And it saddens me that there are more beyond that. Probably shouldn't have been. A lot of people don't even know. You'll just be like, oh, yeah, in that fourth Paris, the Caribbean movie, and they're like, wait, what? Yeah. There's a fourth one? There's a fifth one. I know. But, yeah, so interestingly enough, what happens in this story? It's the same ending as the first part of the movie, right? He's all wet, right? So even in this, he still can't consummate his romance. And there's a little bit of that delaying action. Yeah. And it's interesting because it sort of plays in with the gender stuff, as we'll see here with the famous ending. As he was sleeping, Catherine McGuire was doing all the work. So again, it's almost like it's almost like holding up that patriarchal authority figure that Terrence Fisher loves so much up for ridicule, you know? Which is great, especially yeah. decades prior to the Terrence Fisher movies. Yeah, because this was also at the height of when that fiction was yeah. becoming popular, really, for the first time. But it's like he dreams it and he never actually accomplishes anything. And McGuire is the one who did all the work in the meantime. She's the one who confronted the father, not him. Right? She has way more agency than he does. And if you look at their body language, he's also way more feminine than the way he behaves. Right? Yeah. So he is still not really embodying that same sort of masculine identity. It's interesting because the Sheik, his competitor, is way more conventionally sexual yes as a as a male character which again goes back to him being sort of uh related to rudolph valentino i don't know if i finished mentioning that earlier i don't think you did okay yeah and this is just a great fame this is one of my favorite movie endings ever if you've already seen this movie you understand why but again what is it it's him learning gender roles right but we're going to see from the ending that it's not quite what he expected. Yeah. And I'm going to quote real quickly um, from this Kathleen Rowe Carolyn essay, which is the other essay I'll quote from this book, um, when she writes about some of the gender dynamics and how like the awkwardness of his pursuit of Catherine McGuire kind of reveals something about his, his fantasy land Oz space, right? So here's the quote. And so the boy's dream might finally be understood as driven less by heterosexual desire for the girl than by homosocial desire for a boys-only club where no girls are allowed, a fantasy that combines the heightened drama and excitement of the action-adventure film with the comfort of the buddy film. Thus, the dream recreates a less sinister version of what Pleasure Island 
offered Pinocchio, or Never Never Land offered Peter Pan and the Lost Boys, a space where they will never grow up and can always play with pirates and Indians because Wendy remains in the background to mother them, and Tinkerbell is only a tiny sprite. They never actually wind up doing that and reaching adulthood and maturity. Just like Buster here, who is completely baffled by that. Of course, the interesting thing of having that ambiguity is that it also winds up questioning it instead of just endorsing it, you know? No, 100%. So the movie holds that stuff up for ridicule and does not look at gender as something that's like inherent in people, but it's performative and also handed down. And in a, in a lesser film that could have been played as like a, almost like family guy level joke of just like, Oh no, now he has to have kids game over, man. But like, it's more yes. just like, Oh wait, this is what I've been playing along to yeah. the entire time. And I didn't even know. Yes. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's great about it is cause it's, there's clearly that through line. And also it, it like makes you understand that he, the performance of gender is something that's not inherent to his actual behaviors or actually who he is internally. Right. Yeah. And because Buster Keaton is always known for his great stone face and his like, you know, understated performances, it's kind of interesting to see that moment of surprise at the end too. And it like the understated performance creates room for that throughout the rest of the movie. So it's just really great. And I just, the other thing to really mention from that essay too, is like how it compares the fool to, to the Sherlock Holmes detective as both figures who are weirdly asexual. Although with the fool, it's a little bit more deliberate than Sherlock Holmes. The fool does it to sort of destabilize boundaries, like we said, but also like the, the Sherlock Holmes detective does it because like we were talking about, it's sort of homosocial. And again, that's another connection to the hammer stuff with Frankenstein. It's always weird in those movies, how, much they seem to just not be annoyed with women just getting involved anyway. They're like, God damn it, women, get out of here. You're ruining our experiments. I just want to be alone with Hans and his ass. <laughs> Sets to my project. Yeah, but it's just interesting because the vaudevillian antics become a way of trying to fight off the narrative thing that ultimately doesn't have closure because he never actually reaches the point from the end of the movie. Right, no. we're we're left with that question. So the vaudeville becomes a way to fight something that's deemed as like kind of oppressive of what he actually wants. Clearly, the ending is not truly what he was expecting or anticipating this whole time. No, so what does he really want? Neither of them like really understand why they're playing the parts that they're <laughs> doing. They both yeah. seem to just sort of be stumbling through the dark of like I, this is a, we're supposed to do this right. What's yeah. It? And certainly he is. Yeah. Um, sh she probably is as well, although she definitely seems to. She has a slightly more better understanding. Idea. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's it's just interesting how the movie plays with gender in that way, and uh, there's just so much going on in it. But it's so efficient and like organized in the way that it's made that it's almost hard to talk about it, especially during a commentary track, because it's almost like circular logic. Like everything is so well organized and set up throughout the movie that it's like one thing does multiple subtextual things at the same time. So it's kind of hard to get an entry point. But I think for anybody who is interested in learning more, I think that book is a great resource. I hope listening to this episode has introduced a new way to think about this movie. But I just think this movie is like amazing. No, I think yeah. as because you keep bringing up uh, gender roles and the performative nature of it. Yeah. And I think that's why I really vibed with this movie yesterday is a, that's a key concept to, uh, for me just in everyday life. The idea that gender is mainly an illusion. It's an all performance that we've tricked ourselves into thinking matters. Yeah. And I think this is, and it's why I've liked the try. I, I think just the idea of like, an, an, uh, an effeminate, in a traditional sense, man trying to navigate his way through what life has told him is a straight romance. Like, for no real reason other than that he thinks this is what you're supposed to do. Right. And then sort of have that illusion shattered at the end. Like, it it, it warms my non-binary heart. So, like... Yeah, I mean, and it's just... It's also embracing the enjoyment of that vaudevillian disruption of that... Yes. Of those... Boundaries, right? The normal boundaries of man, woman, how are we supposed to behave? He just blows through it like a rocket. And it's just really in 
amazing to watch that, you know? So it's, it's fun to watch him as a performer use his like mastery and acro and like, you know, grace and his ability to do these specific slapstick performances and use that as a way of disrupting these categories. Cause it's just it, like you said, it's really impressive and uh, it's not moralistic or judgmental in any way. Yeah. Which is, is, is interesting. Which Cause it's great. Yeah. Even if you agree with the movies like opinions or think it's trying to say something smart uh, always, I think if it is kind of uh, moralizing or, I don't know, judgmental, it kind of feels a little bit more heavy handed, you know? Yeah. 100%. But yeah. So I just think this movie's amazing. Even if we can't really fit a conversation of all the amazing stuff about it during the commentary, I just, I would recommend this movie as much as, as any movie we've done that people go watch. Oh yeah. And, and you know me, I like to joke around when we do these old timey movies. I'm just like, Oh, Austin made me not watch another movie from the 20 or thirties again. Here we go. Yeah. But like, one, I am always saying that jokingly. And two, if you're going to go watch any of the old timey movies that Austin has suggested, this is a great jumping off point. I don't think it's necessarily the best one, but I think it is one of the stronger films we've ever done on the podcast. Yeah. So, so yeah, this has been another episode of the Spectator Film Podcast. You can find us online at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or you can find us on Apple Podcasts. Still not used to saying that. Spotify or Stitcher. We also have a letterbox, but I forget what the username is. So just go to the website. Just fucking find us. The episode or the uh, the answer to all your questions is just go to the website. Yeah. Or find Max in person. Yes, please do. Uh, hunt me down and just really awkwardly try to ask me podcast questions. Well, sounds good. Or it doesn't sound. Fuck, we forgot not to talk the entire time. What? We were doing a silent podcast. We were supposed to not talk the entire time.